Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Um, we are so grateful to be here and we're really thankful to GMAT Club for hosting us on today's session, which is all what we call the trifecta when uh, you are applying to Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton, um, or maybe you're just applying to one of those or two of those, but whatever combination you're thinking about, this is definitely a presentation that is geared for you, whether you are applying uh, ahead of those round two deadlines, which are fast approaching in just uh, a few weeks, or if you're actually thinking about this more long term, you might be watching this well after the fact, um, after we've been live, which is great too, because this content is valuable for you for whenever you actually apply. So for a second, I want to go ahead and um, introduce us to you. It's been a while since we've been on the GMAT Club channel. And we're excited to be back. My name is Liza Wheel, and I am the founder of Gatehouse Admissions. Um, I have been an admissions coach for, gosh, over 20 years now, um, and um, and really delighted to be here as part of Gatehouse. Um, I also am going to, before I tell you more about Gatehouse, I'm going to introduce you to my peer, Rachel Nelson. Um, Rachel Nelson, she did her undergrad at Harvard College and then pursued her MBA at Wharton. Um, and she is just an incredibly sought after consultant on the team because of her competence and her commitment to all of her clients. We're gonna be kind of tag teaming this. It's gonna be a little bit casual, a little bit informal, but I just would be remiss not to have her at my side as we go through this valuable information with all of you. So let me tell you a little bit more about Gatehouse Admissions and then we'll jump in. So again, um, I founded Gatehouse Admissions um, just about five, four or five years ago. And it was really the whole premise around the organization was you know, the bar to getting into Harvard and Stanford and Wharton keeps on rising. Um, and I thought the, the level of support that was out there in terms of admissions, coaching, guidance, strategy, it needed to also kind of rise as much as the bar was in order to help all of you who are applying. So that's really our promise here at Gatehouse, um, that different, differentiated level of support. Um, a lot of our strategy is uh, is represented in the team itself. Everybody on the team has an MBA from one of these programs, uh, except for me. I did my MBA at MIT Sloan, um, but now I have coached many, many, many folks to these other schools. But all the consultants on the team have MBAs from either Harvard, Stanford, or Wharton, which just... Um, indicates the level of sort of ambition and, and competitive nature that we all have, but as well as our empathy and our desire to support others that are embarking on a journey that we so enjoyed. So that's a little bit about Gatehouse. I will also say the reason we are here today, again, is because of our focus on Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton, and we're really excited that our resort results speak for themselves. Over 90% of our clients who apply to those three schools will find acceptance at one, at least one of those programs. So, you know, that's really our goal is to help folks with these schools. And we also like to say that um, we also like to, to uh, champion our market effect or, you know, how we compare against the industry. We outperform the sort of the market or the industry by 3x. Um, in looking at the school's acceptance rate or the rate um, or the, the percent of applicants who are invited to interview, we outperform the school's stated rates or percentages by 3x, which is awesome. So that's enough. Rachel, can I just ask you to say hello to everybody before we jump into the good stuff? Hi, everyone. It's nice <laughs> to see you. Nice and to you'll, hear, started, yeah. you'll hear lots more from Rachel as we go on. So we designed this um, presentation really around the 10 tips for applying to Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. Um, and look, you're, as you go along, as we go along, you might have questions. I encourage you to add them to the chat. Um, you know, we'll field some of them. If it's pertinent to the slide, we'll, we'll field it as we go along. Otherwise, we'll tee it up. We're going to try to end this session um, within 45 minutes to tackle any additional questions. If your question is really specific to you, definitely feel free to add it in the chat. But remember it because that might be not, not be one that we do um, or address as we go along. So hold on to it. And you can always put it back on the chat um, at the end if we haven't had a chance to answer it. So definitely, we want to uh, make this as interactive as possible. But so here are the, the 10 tips. Um, and this is a lot of information to cover. 
but we wanted to be as holistic and comprehensive as possible. So first and foremost, be realistic about your chances. A lot of applying to these schools, it's important to have the right mindset. Wherever you are, um, if you're thinking about these schools, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it can feel like the end all be all. You have to get into one of these programs. These programs are life changing. And while those things are true, it can be life changing. You know, it's important to realize how, quite frankly, hard or impossible it is to get into these programs. So I'd like to start with some stats just to help understand how hard it is to get into these programs. So I'm not going to go through all of these numbers, but I do want to call call out a few things. Number one, the headline. Failure at all um, is more likely than success at any one of these programs. And I know I'm starting on sort of a, um, a down note, but it, again, it's about level setting with yourself, setting your expectations, and then you know doing whatever you can to, to tip the, the scales in your favor. So if you look at Harvard, over 8,000 people applied. This is the most recent year that we have stats on. Um, uh, uh, over 1,100 were accepted, so about 14%, which means over 7,000 people were rejected. Okay? Stanford, it, not quite as many applicants. It's a smaller program, so 6, 000, over 6,000 applied, only an 8.6% acceptance rate. Over 5,600 of people were rejected, of the applicants were rejected. Um, Wharton, over 400, oh, sorry, sorry, over 4,800 applicants were rejected. So there's a lot of no's in this process. And it's important to look at these numbers and realize they apply to you too. If it's a 14, 8% or 22%, those chances are pretty low. And you need to understand that that could very well be you. You could be one of those, uh, those rejections. So earning a spot takes a lot of, quite frankly, luck. But the other thing I will say is earning a spot really takes a tremendous amount of work and excellence. And that's why we're here today. It's almost to accept these numbers and then forget about them and do whatever you can to put your absolute best foot forward so that you increase the chances of you being one of the lucky ones to be accepted. So that's step one. Understand the sort of the, the um, the playing field, understand the chances, and then put that noise behind you. And then start looking at what it is the schools really are looking for themselves. So consider the what the schools are looking for. This might, might sound obvious, but I, and I'm sure Rachel and I could trade stories from, you know, hours on how many times we get things like questions of, what are the schools looking for? Do the schools want to hear this? Or, you know, I think the school might want to see this side of me. And, you know, you don't want to get too caught up in trying to interpret what they're looking for. And you also want to look at the evidence that they provide. So here's what two of the schools, as long as I can change my slide for you, say. And the reason we chose Harvard and Stanford here is because they've been super consistent and super forthcoming about their evaluation criteria criteria for at least the past decade, if not two de decades. So HBS says it's looking for folks that demonstrate a habit of leadership, analytical aptitude and appetite, and engage community citizenship. Stanford has slightly different words, but kind of the same gist. Demonstrate leadership potential, intellectual vitality, and personal qualities and uh, contributions. And Morton would say the same gist thing. So this is what they're looking for. They're looking for smart, capable, and caring leaders. And, and I would say in our words, the additions that we'd say is like personalized leadership. And this is something we often get is like, well, gosh, I haven't managed anybody, so I'm not really a leader. Leadership can come in all shapes and sizes. The schools have no preconceived idea of what, the, what kind of leader they expect to see in you. They just expect to see you as a leader, whether that is a thought leader, uh, a servant leader, a team leader, someone who leads by doing, leads by example, um, someone who takes brave, um, brave steps. All of those are forms of leadership. What's important for you is to communicate what kind of leader you are through your application. They are absolutely looking for your smarts and academic excellence. Um, these schools, you know, they they want to see people who have always sought to excel academically um, and will be looking at your transcript, transcript and your test scores as evidence of that. 
and they want to see that you're someone who stands out. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but but sometimes people think, you know, oh, I've got to be this person when I'm applying to Stanford, this person when I'm applying to Harvard, and this other person when I'm applying to Wharton. At the end of the day, these schools are looking for all the same things that we just said, and they want to find superstars. So however you are a superstar, you want to be communicating that unilaterally across all the schools. So de um, demonstrable standout performance, whether that's through um, you know, top rankings or promotions or being um, just exemplary accomplishments on your resume. They want to understand what your purpose is, uh, where you're headed and how business school fits in. Um, we will also uh, talk a little bit more about this going forward too, but they don't really care what your goals are. They don't, it doesn't matter if they're common or very unique or different. What they want to see is that you are inspired to reach those goals and you really thought deeply about how a school's program can help you get there. And then we, we bucket the last thing is the intangibles, really the, the softer side of you that really captures who you are, your values, your character. So whether it's things like grit and tenacity and perseverance, um, kindness, empathy, um, creative thinking, all of those things, um, it's also trying to avoid some of the things that are red flags for the school, such as ego or too much of a too much ambition or competition. So, you know, keep that in mind. You want to you sometimes feel like you have to show them how great you are. But how you do that, you want to let them come to their own judgment of that without telling them. And. So we'll jump more into it. Rachel, did you want to add something? Yeah, I was going to just add. Um, so the, one of the words that I, I think we use a lot is authentic. So the more that you can be authentic to who you are, so whether that's in your goals, reflecting what you actually want to do, or your experience being what it actually was, um, you're much better off crafting a story around the truth than you are making up a story that the schools want to hear. Um, it tends to be a much more interesting read. You're much more passionate about it. Um, so this is kind of a tie-in both to this point and the, than the one before um, around kind of school selection. It's almost like, you know, if as you approach your school list, the easiest path forward is to think about who you are and what you want to do and then figure out the schools that appeal to you and that work for you rather than, um, you know, basically crafting a story that you think fits what the schools are looking for, because they're um, really looking as lies except for people who are superstars in their area. And that doesn't necessarily mean a clone of somebody else. So I sometimes have a you know, client who will say, oh, but I know so-and-so who got in because they look like this or did, they did X, Y, Z. That's great for them. That was their path. To a certain extent, that path is taken. Now what's your path, right? Who are you? And, um, and kind of what's your rationale for being let in? Rachel, I think that's great feedback. Um, also, the, the one thing I'll say is I, I find when people try to write what they think the schools want to hear, it just falls apart. It, 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 it just, it completely, it, it, not only are these all these other reasons, it's just usually if you're trying to predict what you think the school is looking for, you're much more likely to fail than if you're just being honest with yourself. So don't fall down that path of doing it. It won't get you where you want it to. And I would add on, we're going to talk in a little while about resume, about um, the short answers and kind of all the other stuff. I think people get really focused on essays, um, but kind of the other meat and, you know, having a complete disconnect between what you want to do and what you've done um, is also confusing for the admissions committee. So you want to be able to explain why are your goals your goals? What's your rationale? Um, you know, kind of what your passions are. So, um, you know just the reality of most things is the more it's grounded in the truth, the easier it is to substantiate with what you've done um, and for your entire story to kind of hang together and make sense. And not to mention you're more prepared for the interview too, which is a big yeah. part of this. So um, great. Awesome. Um, tip number three. So this is somewhere else. And a lot of these tips, I would say, are all just generated from working with so many clients and seeing the places where they've tripped up. But 
before what we see is often people are like, oh, I've already started this, uh, this essay. I'm trying a few different things. I'd really like your feedback. And they'll jump right into trying to write before taking stock of themselves. And so what we would always say is like, Focus inward. It's one of the few times that they know, look inward, think about yourself first before worrying about those essays, but it will serve you well. And what do I mean by this? And the other thing I'm also going to say um, is if, um, as you guys are going through this, we did try to put a lot of valuable tips in here. So if you're finding this valuable, definitely like it, um, share this with your friends. That sort of feedback for us is really valuable because then we know what sort of content to think about creating in the future. So please let us know and share in the comments and, um, and like the video too as we go on, go on. So what do I mean by this sort of uh, reflecting inward? And you know, the way to think about this is to go wide and to go deep. And when we talk about going wide, you wanna spend some time um, thinking about your journey, how you got from where you started to where you are today. And, and thinking about the pivotal moments in your upbringing in college and your career that have really shaped your choices, your hopes, your values, who you are. Um, it is thinking about that timeline. And, and, and the reason we stress this is you don't want to forget about your upbringing. And those moments that have shaped you, um, you know, a lot of that stuff started very early on, but it's all valuable to reflect on when you're starting to think about putting together your applications for business school. So one way to think about it is to think about that journey that you've taken that had brought you to where you are today. But that's not enough. The next step is to really think about, in tandem with that, to think about the different hats that you've worn or the different identities that you've played, the, the different you know buckets of who you've been. Um, you, you can start by thinking about who you've been in college, who you are professionally, who you are in the community. Um, but even in those buckets, you might find that you have multiple different identities or hats that you wear. Um, you know, just as a really basic example, imagine that there is a, uh, someone that works at, um, say, McKinsey in consulting. So one of their identities is a consultant. Um, the applicant also happens to be um, when they were in college, they were on the college swimming team um, and they were actually the treasurer of the swim team. Um, and they are involved in the Big Brother organization more recently, um, in part because this applicant um, has a younger brother with whom they were really close. So now you start sort of bucketing the different identities. And then for each of those different identities, you want to consider um, the biggest challenges and wins with each of them, within each of them. So really, what are the accomplishments that you are proud of, the outcomes, the impact that you've been able to drive in each of these identities? So you want to go both broad and deep when you are developing this inventory of your experiences. But once you have done this, what you'll have is a set of content that then you can take a step back from and start looking at and connecting the dots. You can start um, um, spotting different stories that illustrate different aspects of who you are. And when you have done all this work up front, this is something that at Gatehouse, we have a tool called the Experience Inventory um, to aid you in that process. But that once you've done all that, then you can start looking at the questions themselves and then referring back to your experience inventory to figure out what elements of your story you're going to share in the essays. Okay. Can I, can I add mm -hmm. one more thing on that one? Of course. So this is a very, very basic um, point, but um, and we'll kind of talk a bit more about the essays in a second, but um, read the question, right? So read the question and think about what you're being asked to answer, and this seems completely obvious, but often we find people answer the question that they want to answer rather than being answering the question that they're asked. Um, and so I would say, you know, there's a lot of different ways to kind of take this on board. Some of the questions are a lot more specific. They're a lot more tactical. They're a lot more, I don't wanna say formulaic, but it's very clear what they want, what they want you to put on the page. And others are um, a lot more um, kind of open-ended. Um, and so to the extent that somebody, that the school gives you really specific questions, you want to be framing up your answers around those questions. And to the extent that they're a lot more open-ended, um, those are usually an opportunity for you to be 
more vulnerable to um, show your growth, your progression, the ways in which you have learned things over the years. Um, and so that ties very much into the experience inventory, for particularly for that second set of questions, those ones that are more open-ended. It's really, I would say, almost impossible to do that without some degree of self-reflection. Um, so I think that inward reflection for those um, open-ended questions that are basically like, tell us something, uh, is really, really crucial because they're not structured as um, a list that you can just provide. And so, you know, without the self-reflection, there is just basically no content to the essay. Um, so, yeah. so read the question. It seems, that, seems obvious, but it's, you know, maybe not quite as obvious as it seems. No, it's, it's so true. Um, it, it's so true. And um, it also goes back to focused on what the question is because meaning um, focused on you, not what you think you um, they want to hear, focus on what you want to tell them. And actually that tees us up well for thinking about sequencing strategically. And so again, this, this presentation is really designed for those folks that are thinking about applying to all three schools. Um, so Harvard, Stanford, and Morton, but of course, um, you know, maybe not all three, maybe one or two, but once in, you know, once, if you were applying, we actually would encourage you to apply more than to just these three, because we looked at those acceptance rates earlier on. It's always wise to increase your chances by increasing even the, the, the schools on your list, if they're going to help you reach your goals. Um, but this, you know, because we're focused on Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton, one of the questions that we often deal with with our clients is which school to start with. Um, and we're going to jump that when even when creating this uh, this this presentation, we are sort of wrestling with: do we start with the essay questions or do we start with the sequencing? Because it's a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. You can't really answer one without the other, but we're going to try to. So. Look, there's no right answer here about sequencing um, which of the schools to start with. But what is important is start with one, come up the learning curve, wrestle with those essays, get them right before you start thinking about the second. If you start all three at once, you'll have too many plates in the air. You won't be able to learn from one school to the next and you will struggle. So that would be our, our number one advice, no matter how you sequence it. But in order to figure out how to sequence it. There's actually some different things to think about. Um, you know, there, and again, no right answer, but you can think about, well, when are they due? Maybe I'll start with the first one that's due. In round two, most of the schools, unfortunately, or these schools, they're right on top of each other, January 3rd and 4th. So there's not much breathing room. If you start with HBS, you, that doesn't give you much more time to handle uh, Stanford or Wharton. In round one, just FYI, typically Harvard and Stan, uh, excuse me, Harvard and Wharton are due back to back, and then Stanford is due a week later. So that might be reason to actually start with Harvard and, uh, and then Wharton and then move on to Stanford. Another variable we consider is like the difficulty of the application itself. So the all applications are not created equal. I wish they were, but they're not. Um, if you think about on a scale, our own gatehouse scale here from one to 10, um, and you rate the difficulty, the difficulty uh, Stanford is by far the hardest. You are going to spend so many more hours on Stanford's application. If you're doing it well, if you're doing it justice and doing, um, you know, as we said, really putting in the work effort that's required to have a strong application, you will spend considerably more hours on your Stanford application than you will on your Harvard application and many, many more hours than you will on your Wharton application. Wharton's essay questions are very um, focused. Harvard's is open-ended, but it's just really one. Stanford has both open-ended and focused and lots of essays and they're really hard to get done and done right. So consider that. Um, Think about that acceptance rate. Why is that important? Well, are you shoring up your chances um, in the right way? Do you want to double down on making sure your Wharton app is as strong as possible because you have the highest chances of getting in based on the acceptance rate? Or are you really looking for a moonshot here and you want to go for GSB? And so you want to give the most love you've got to GSB. But remember, if you spend a lot of hours on GSB, you're not going to have as many to spend on Wharton. All these things are just considerations. Don't worry about it too much. Um, but, you know, there is some um, there is some strategy here. Essay uh, applicability to other schools. 
you know, Stanford, because it asks for the most content, it is, it, 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 there's the most, you have the most opportunity to reuse themes and ideas and sometimes some of the writing from GSB for the other schools. It's not necessarily the case for the other schools with one exception. Um, it, it can be, but not necessarily. So again, you know, could be reason to start with Stanford because you'll get through all that content and then can use some of it um, strategically. And again, it depends on your preference. Which one do you want us to, um, to start with as well? So um, just some ideas to illustrate this, because this is the kind of thing that we actually spend a lot of our time uh, with our clients on trying to figure out which to start with. You know, some folks um, like to uh, start with, and this is generally for our clients that have a lot of time, start them on Stanford. It's the hardest application, you know, like get the hardest part out of the way. I often equate this from eating, I don't know who, Lucky Charms, but like saving all your marshmallows to the end as you finish your cereal. That was something I always did. I would eat the stuff I didn't like first. So I had by the end, the easy stuff. It's the same with starting with Stanford. It's really tough. But by the time you get to HBS and Wharton, it's going to feel so much easier. Um, and you can leverage a lot of the content. Um, but it's also really, my, it's just kind of overwhelming often to start with Stanford. So often, if you are only have a little time, it might be best to start with actually Wharton where again, those questions are more contained. So you get um, early wins, you have this feeling of like, you know, momentum and um, productivity, like output. And then you can, with armed with a little bit of that confidence, you can tackle the harder schools. So no right or wrong, but be thoughtful. The biggest thing is to sequence your work, get those essays right for one school, then start moving on to the second school, and then start moving on to the third school. Um, and with that, we're going to talk a little bit more about, um, uh, we're going to talk about each of the essay questions and I'm keeping an eye on the questions. Um, but I think we're going to, ta we'll tackle those towards the end. Please keep them coming. And if it is something that's applicable to the slide, we'll also tackle it, um, as we go along. So with that, Rachel, you want to talk about perfecting school number one? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to build on what Liza said. I mean, the key here is um, a lot of the content or the ideas can be used from one school to the next. Um, and so the more that you can be working on one, getting it perfect. I mean, I, I like to use sort of a, a parking lot analogy. I like to have a client start with the first school, uh, take it to, let's say, 90, 95 percent, park the essays pick up with a second school. And obviously, depending on how much time you have, you may not be able to take it to 95%, maybe it's to 70, and you're picking up the next school and working on them at the same time. But the idea of being able to put something away and then come back to it uh, with a fresh set of eyes, I think is really, really useful. Um, but this comment applies, I would say, both for the essays, which we're gonna talk about, but the exact same comment applies for your short answer questions, which we'll cover later. Um, obviously the resume, you'll iterate through the process, but with the short answers, same approach. Pick one school, which school are you applying to first? I generally advise clients to pick a date before the deadline and kind of, see, you know, kind of pick target application dates for each of the schools, figure out which one is first, and then get that entire application ready to go. So that means, um, you know, work on that online application first, those short answers, and then um, move on to the next ones. So the idea here is that you can take what you've learned with one school and then apply it to the next. So there's no point in reinventing the wheel over and over again. Um, and yeah, and that's kind of the, the key here. So um, we've already covered this, but I'm going to repeat it. Answer the question that you are asked. Um, and so back to this, um, you know, kind of idea of understanding what the school is looking at. In this case, Harvard, they're really focused on an open-ended question that allows you to tell them what, uh, what you want them to know about you. And obviously they're also covering on career goals. Um, but this is, a, this is, as Liza said, um, depending on the path you choose, can be a good starting point because it does dip your toe into the idea of um, a school with an open-ended essay, much like Stanford's, um, but the overall application is not quite as overwhelming as, as Stanford's is. Uh, then we've got GSB. So um, Stanford has a lot of questions. There's an, a question A, which is very similar to Harvard's um, in terms of the fact that it's open-ended, although 
Sometimes um, applicants will have very similar essays uh, in terms of the same thesis, and oftentimes they will not. So that's not necessarily the same case. Um, but B, this why Stanford is very similar to Wharton's question, which we'll cover in a minute. Um, and then there are short impact essays. So um, when Liza said that there was a lot of meat to Stanford, that's what she meant. Effectively, you're answering two or one longer essay and then um, five shorter essays. Um, and so there's just a lot of materials uh, that you need to produce for purposes of this um, for the school. And then finally, we've got Wharton, which is a little bit more straightforward. It's two really specific questions. You know when you've hit them. Um, and for Wharton, um, question A, and to some extent, question or question one and question two, to some extent, um, cover uh, GSB's question two about kind of why Stanford. So the idea here is be strategic beyond just the essays, thinking about which school makes sense to start with. But then um, you can also think about how the essays allow you to use content from one school to the next. Uh, but the key thing, and this is not a comment for Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton, but for the entire process, read what you are asked to do, whether it's a question, whether it's um, in the short answers. I've had people um, describe their bosses the wrong way or um, describe a program the wrong way. It's like specificity matters, being correct matters. Read the question that you're asked and give them what they ask you for. Um, because that's one thing I would say is um, the schools will change essay questions when they want to learn something else. Some of the schools don't change their essays, which is fine. Um, but if they did want different information from you, they would change their questions. So you know, know that they're asking this question for a reason. And um, I would say particularly for Harvard and for Stanford, you know, Stanford's A question and Harvard's main question, it's a hard essay to write. And people often try to like skirt around it or would prefer to answer a different question um, because it is just hard. There is no way to answer Harvard and, and, and Stanford's essays without doing that soul searching that we talked about already. And just I'll add a few things here. Number one, on the, the optional. Um, so one question is, do we need to answer optional essay? Um, and this is by Qu uh, uh, Kenneth asked this question about, do I have to answer the optional essay? So there's two different answers there. I would say for Stanford's optional essays, do not think of them as optional. So, you know, they're basically saying optional. Think about times you've created a positive impact, whether in professional, extracurricular, academic, or other settings. What was your impact? What made it significant to you or others? You should absolutely take advantage of this opportunity to show the schools that you can drive impact, 100%. And if you can't come up with examples, keep thinking, because I can assure you the peers who are competing for spots will take these opportunities to tell the school something more or tell, tell Stanford something more that they've accomplished or some impact that they have um, that they have driven. So you should absolutely um, respond to it. And I would absolutely, I would actually say that for the second one, um, elaborate on how your background or life experiences have helped shape um, your recent actions or choices. I think this is like, we're all a product of our upbringing and who we, you know, how we grew up, what, you know, that, that those are influences and presumably they influence how we act today. So I always see this as a window for the schools to get to know someone better. Um, I, I, I see these optional questions as a boon to the applicant to share more about them. The sort of, is there anything else we need to know about your application? Those optional questions, that's going to depend completely on you, whether or not there is something you need to clarify or red flag to discuss. But these optional essays would absolutely encourage you to respond to. Um, Rachel spoke about answering the question. I will say that often I see these impact essays, for example, and there's no impact. They don't mention any impact. They just tell a story. And it's like, wait, you've missed seen the question. So it, it really does happen when people miss the miss the question. So make sure you're answering um, answering them. Yeah, and so I, to, to add on to this uh, optional essay question, so exactly as Liza said, the Stanford ones really are not optional. Um, and I would say, think about it as you want to take every opportunity that you can to tell the schools about yourself. That's the biggest challenge is fitting in all the great things about you into these small little crevices that you have. Um, so I would say take every opportunity that you can to give them what they ask for. Um, but in terms of the optional essay, so there's a question at the end that says, you know, kind of please let us know if there's something else 
um, that we need to know. And they're usually pretty specific. They'll say something like GMAT score, GPA, um, you know, a, a break in your work experience. Uh, so read what they've said. That is not an opportunity for you to write another essay that, you know, and I would say the vast majority of clients of, you know, of applicants leave that blank. It's perfectly fine if you put something in there, but that is addressing a specific issue that you want to make the admissions committee, that you want to explain for the admissions committee. So um, just be very careful to read, again, read what you're being asked to do. Yeah, because I'll tell you, the it it is so, this um, application process is very much a test of um, strategic communication and your judgment. So, you know, just as Rachel said, sometimes people put completely like random essays into that optional essay bucket. Um, Wharton gives a fair amount of space. So people are like, oh, I've got room for some random essay that they're not asking for. This is awesome. I'm going to tell them more about me. So think about that poor reader who's assigned like, I don't know, tens, tens and ten, dozens and dozens of applications to get through. They've got themselves on a rhythm. They're reading essay one and two, one and two, one and two. And then they get to, whoa, what's this extra 500 word essay that I have to make sense of? You're doing yourself no favors by trying to shove in something that they're not asking for. So it is, even though we're, you know, absolutely take advantage of the opportunities you have to tell them, but then also make sure you don't um, push the envelope too far with those optional essays because you're just going to annoy the reader too. So it's always a balance on these things. Um, and guys, definitely, please, we definitely are looking for feedback. So if you're enjoying this, give it us, give us a thumbs up. Um, we really want to create more content and more videos for you. And that will be, um, your feedback to us will be valuable. Back to you, Rachel. All right. So number six, leverage what you can between the schools, but don't get lazy. So to the extent that you can reuse ideas, reuse content, as Liza said. So um, I think, you know, we kind of covered between Harvard and Stanford, sometimes there's reusable content between Wharton and Stanford's B. Um, so great to reuse content if and when you can, but don't get lazy. And that means that for each of these schools, you need to research, research, research. Um, and I would say this is like a number one, maybe it's number two misconception. People are like, yes, um, Stanford's great at entrepreneurship, Harvard's great at leadership, Wharton is a quantitative school. And they're like, that's going to be the basis of my research. No, no, no. You need to be much, much, much more specific. Um, and lies, you know, we've got here kind of identifying courses, identifying clubs, identifying experiences. But I would take it one step forward, further, which is what's the experience you're going to participate in and how does it relate to you, right? So again, Wharton's very explicit in their second question. Tell us what you're going to participate in, specifically how you're going to contribute and how it ties to something that you've done. But to the extent that in any of these essays, and this is true for all the schools that you're applying to, you want to be really specific about what you're going to do and why. And so that means when you name a club, say what role you would take. Would you take a leadership role? It's fine if you wouldn't, but if you would, say what that role would be. Are you going to help organize the conference? Would you, would you arrange a panel? Who would you invite to speak? What would the panel be called? Would you have a professor moderate it? So the more that you can be specific about the things that you want to do, um, professors who you're interested in taking a class from, what is what kind of research is that professor known for? Um, all these things do two things. One is they show the school that you are researching them, that you're interested enough to, um, to do that research, but you also show fit. And so to go back to the very beginning, number one, as you think about your list strategically and kind of optimize your chances for getting in, the easiest way to get into any business school is for what you want to do to fit with what the school offers. And this is your opportunity to show how, um, how what you bring fits with what the school wants and it needs. And that can be done in many ways. It can be both how you contribute to the school while you're on campus, and it can also be through your goals, which is sort of the way in which you are, um, you know, to some extent that your interaction with the school continues on. Um, so really be thinking about, um, we, you know, we talk about sometimes it's like the give and the take. The take is what are the things that you need from the school to achieve your goals? Um, and then the second piece is what are you going to give? So, you know, you see it here in the last bullet, what will you bring to campus uh, that somebody else can't bring? And that's a great way to differentiate yourself from others. All right, managing your recommenders. So, um, yeah, this is one where kind of the same as we started with before, 
read the questions, make sure that your uh, recommenders know what the questions are. So the key to question one is performance versus peers. So that is um, not just a matter of saying all the ways in which you're good. Um, it's a matter of them being very specific as to what you do, how, as Liza said before about a different topic, the impact of what you do is crucial. And then understanding how what you have done is different than or more than what would be expected from somebody at your level. So that point of, of, of relativity is really, really crucial uh, because that's what the school has asked for. So second question um, that they ask most of the schools is around constructive weakness. And I think, you know, Simran asked a question about how do you address one's weaknesses? This is a question or kind of, a, you know, one where um, oftentimes I feel like recommenders might try to dance around giving a weakness because they think it somehow benefits um, the candidate. Or I sometimes have applicants who are like, ah, oh, I don't want to remind my recommenders of any any of my weaknesses It's because that's going to paint me in a bad light. And it's like, no, no, no. The school has given you an opportunity to say the things that you're great at, and now you have to give them a weakness. And that doesn't show failure, right? What you want to demonstrate with the weakness question is what you've learned from it. So what's the situation, you know, and then how did you take that and how did you grow from it? And so that comment that I'm making is true both for this question too for the letters of recommendation, but it's true of any question. Sometimes you might get it in a different application. You might get it in... Um, in an interview, right? The failure question is a really big one. Failure in and of itself is not a problem. Having a company fail that fails, having a project that fails. In fact, um, I think most people would say that you learn a lot more from failure than you do from success. So the key thing for this is really about your learning and how you've grown. So kind of last, that's my last comment and kind of the, the questions I know we're running out of time here. Um, but I would say, think about who your recommenders are, Pick them carefully. You don't be so focused on title. You really want people who know you well. Most of the schools will very specifically ask you to give them a direct supervisor. So be sure that you have one of your two recommendations that is a direct supervisor and can tick that box. And then be thinking about who works well with that application. And what I mean is we want the applications to work together and to show us a good perspective of who you are without being duplicative. So, um, you know, in terms of managing your recommenders, make sure you're very, very clear about what the deadlines are. Make sure they know how many schools you're applying to. You're, this, it's a big ask to do a recommendation well. And so you want to be as helpful for them as you possibly can. And that means give them the dates up front, let them know, you know, everything that they're being asked to do. Um, and then it may be helpful for you to give them specific examples. So for question one and question two, remind them, maybe you give them your resume, maybe you give them a list of places where you've had really significant impact and remind them what that impact was. So make it easy for them um, and then just help, help them and make sure that they're moving forward. So I would say checking in along the way to make sure that they're managing to the deadline is really, really crucial because for many, not necessarily all, but for many of the schools, your application is not complete unless your unless your recommendation is in. All right, so number eight, uh, resume. So um, this, I, so I would say one big um, takeaway is your resume is not the resume that you will have used to find a job, right? So the technical skills that might make another employer hire you are different from the skills that um, a business school is looking for. So I think you've heard a couple of themes throughout our talk, but the two key things I would say you wanna to demonstrate to business school and the resume is a great place to do this is one, your leadership. So showing business school all the ways in which you have gone above and beyond and in which you have led and that doesn't necessarily mean showing them all of your promotions, although please, if you're sponsored, if you've been promoted, great to include those if you, if you manage people, but it can be leading a team, it can be soliciting feedback, it can be collaborating. All these are ways of being a leader. Um, informal leadership, you do recruiting, you work on onboarding, you've done new hire training. Again, all of these things that step up above and beyond your day job are great examples of leadership. Um, and then the second thing is you want to show 
impact. So we want to understand in every single bullet, why is this bullet in your resume? So it's almost like you want to think about your resume as there's opportunity cost for every single thing that's in your resume. So this is really a greatest hits list, right? This is not going to be a laundry list and you need to be able to justify every single bullet that's in there. So you want to make sure you are very specific. There's a very clear impact. Make sure that you might even hand your resume to your mother or your grandmother, right? You, you, the, I, you know, you want anybody off the street to be able to read it. We don't want industry jargon or generalities that leave the reader scratching their head. Um, and so, you know, we want your resume to be very specific to you, to be, you know, not necessarily describing what a team accomplished, but kind of what was your um, contribution to that team. So, you know, how did you specifically make that impact happen? Kind of what did you do? Um, and so I think the other key thing is um, in a business school resume, you want to have a leadership or a leadership and community service section. Um, and that you want to call out specifically from the rest of your of your resume, uh, you know, from the other sections, and you want to give it space. And that may mean that you have fewer bullets under your work experience, and that's fine. Because um, whereas when you apply for a job, your previous work experience is really, really crucial, in business school, seeing that leadership and that impact is crucial, both at work, but also outside of work. So definitely make sure your resume has a leadership section. And I would just say rule of thumb, Liza can chime in. You want it to be a third of your resume, a quarter of your resume, like no less than that. You want it to be a substantive section. Well, since you said I could chime in, I will chime in on that. Um, I would say this, that if you're like, oh gosh, I don't have anything to put in my leadership section, you need to start doing, you need to start building, you know, uh, pursuing more activities, finding ways to take on leadership, and even, dare I say it, like evaluate whether or not you're ready to apply to business school. So, you know, we love resumes at Gatehouse because it's always so amazing to see how someone who's really proud of their resume got them to where they are today is just transformed through the process. We do so many iterations on their resume and, and really help clients um, present themselves in a very different way that they didn't even know they were capable of before they started. But one area, this, uh, this focus on leadership, it can be really daunting and intimidating. Sometimes it's, it requires thinking creative, um, creatively about your experiences, but other times it's actually an indication that you need to step up your involvement, whether it's at work or um, in the community, so that you can show more leadership to the schools. And we just got a question asking, do you prefer one page resume or can it be more than one page? The rule of thumb is one page unless you have more than 10 years of experience. If you have more than 10 years of professional working experience, then you can go onto that second page. But again, remember strategic communication, right? No, the, the admissions team, even if they say two pages is fine, they don't really want to read two pages. Get it down to one page. You're doing yourself a favor unless you have such a, you know, you have 10 years of experience or more where that second page is really warranted. And two things I want to add. So I just want to reiterate one thing Liza said. When she says 10 years or more, she doesn't mean five years. <laughs> Literally, like if you have five or six years, people are always like, oh, I, I can't fit it to one page. It's like I have seen people with eight years of experience. I've actually seen people with 10 and 12 years of experience. Everybody can fit their resume to one page, right? Yep. Because the reality is this is the greatest hits list. So we don't need every single bullet that you've ever done. So I would push almost everybody to be at one page. Um, so the point I think Liza made this earlier, this comment applies to you, everybody here who's listening. If you think this applies to the person next to you and you have this special experience that needs to be on two pages, that's not true. Your resume should be one page, just like everybody's el everybody mm -hmm. else's. The one other thing I want to say is I think Liza was right on that. If you don't have any leadership experiences, you may want to go, um, think about whether you want to postpone, um, to a future round and spend some time developing them. But I would also say oftentimes people have hidden leadership and I kind of alluded to a couple of them or several of them. So things that you might do in the office that you don't think of as being leadership, but maybe you're on the office green team or you participate in the office uh, soccer team or you run the paddle team or you've organized a, um, 
a group that volunteers or mentoring, whatever it might be, all of these things are leadership activities. And the same thing is true in university. Um, maybe you worked while you were in college. Maybe you did an internship. Maybe you, um, you know, did tutoring, right? You tutored people for money. All of these things are leadership activities. Um, it doesn't have to just be that you ran some big organization. So I often find that for a lot of people, as they think expansively and really kind of like dig around in their experiences, and actually this is another plug for the experience inventory um, or something like it, because it is a good way to kind of surface activities that you've been involved in. But I would just say before you despair, um, actually just thinking through the way that you've spent your time outside of your day job or outside of class in university is a really good way to um, think about whether there's other kind of hidden leadership activities. All right. All right. Go ahead. I was going to um, say, oh, go yeah. ahead. Um, actually, I'll I'll jump into this one. Sure. Don't forget the small stuff. I'm only doing this really because I'm keeping an eye on the time. I will also say, guys, like as, as we said at the beginning, like we're covering a ton here. Every single one of these could be its own hour session. And in fact, we have a number of these hour sessions. Actually, um, we did a series of workshops um, with GMAT Club early, probably a few years ago, that dives into recommenders, resume, the small stuff, the short answers. So if any of these, as you start working on these, you're going to have more questions and things like that, definitely check out our entire workshop series on these topics. But I will um, say on this, on point number nine, don't forget the small stuff. And the reason you shouldn't forget the small stuff is I guarantee others will. So this becomes a low hanging fruit for you to really make sure that you're taking advantage of opportunities to share the school with the school as much um, about you as possible. What I mean, what we mean here is really the short answers. The short answers, the online application, it's basically the questions that you have to fill in when you log in and, um, and set up your, um, your account. Um, yes, of course, some of them are like your name and that you don't have to be too strategic about, but there's things like describe your job, describe, um, your, uh, you know, key accomplishments in that role, the biggest challenge in that role, why you left that role, all of those things. Um, it's, you want to spend the time, don't shortchange, don't just cut and paste. Um, one of the folks on our team, Brooke, she was, um, on HBS's admissions team for over a decade. And what she always says is she loves reading the online applications because she get, actually gets to learn about companies, the way they're organized, different jobs and different roles. So if you are describing your company, let's say you work at, um, let's say you work at strategy and in management consulting and you write management consulting as a description. They know that. What can you tell specifically a little bit about how strategy and is different from other competitors in the space or your office in particular, or even the areas that you focus on? Look at this as an opportunity to educate and sort of delight the reader. So make sure that you, um, you give yourself time, um, be smart about how you use these, uh, these questions to reveal more about you and consider kind of both the hard and soft dimensions of you and what your job has entailed as well. And then finally, um, avoid a last minute scramble. Can't stress this enough because we see it, we live it, we live it with our clients. Um, way too often. We're always saying, you're going to get busy, you're going to get busy. Lots of them listen, but then there's always some folks that scramble. So to the extent that you can just really um, assume the work is going to be there, there's a lot of it. And to get started um, quickly and to make sure that you're giving yourself time on the back end to get this done and in and, and sort of submitted with confidence and grace. So iteration and patience, they're super vital in this process. Um, the writing's hard. You have to show, don't tell. You have to reveal who you, you are as a person, but you can't tell them who you are as a person. You can't just list your accomplishments, but you still have to share some of your accomplishments. You have to focus on the why and the how as, as much as the what, meaning what was your motivation? What was your intention? Um, and you need to bring share enough context so the reader can see your world, but not too much context so that we get lost. Um, you know, you have to be yourself as much as possible. Vulnerability is compelling, but so is confidence and confidence. So it's you have to be balanced. The writing is hard. 
You need to iterate. You need to give yourself some breaks and be ready for your essays to evolve. Um, early intervention and redirection is much more valuable than late intervention. So I, you know, the headline, seek outside expertise if you are early, not late. It, 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 you know, it, when we are looking at something at the 11th hour, uh, there's only so much we can help you and our clients change it or any outside expert, right? If you're asking them at the last minute, there's only so much you can do. If, if the time for a major redirect, the time for substantial improvement that ship has sailed. So if you are thinking about, wow, are these really where they need to be? You want to start having that those conversations much earlier in the process. And then by the time you're doing that, you know, 10th iteration of an essay, it's you're not changing much. It's really you're just fine tuning. Um, and then choose your experts wisely. I wrote an article on this once, like of how much time um, or how many times you get, uh, you ask somebody on the outside to read your essay they don't like it. They tell you all this feedback because, of course, when you ask somebody for feedback, they will give it to you because they want to feel like they're doing right by you. So even if they love something, they're going to feel the need to try to improve it. But, you know, is that person, does that person have experience in coaching others on admissions? Do they, you know, are they projecting? That can be something to keep an eye out. So just choose your experts wisely. Don't share your stuff with too many people. You're just going to have too much noise to then decipher and make sense of. So Liza, there's a couple of questions in here. I know we're running out of time, but there's a couple of questions around um, a career break mm -hmm. or explaining a layoff. And so I want to make sure that we cover that because it seems like it's a pertinent point. Yeah. Um, so let me start with the what we already said. Answer the question that's asked. So one of the questions was, um, is that relevant um, to put into your essay? If it relates to the story that you're telling, maybe it fits there, um, but chances are it doesn't. So I would absolutely use the optional essay to explain a career break. Some of the schools specifically have a question that asks you if you've had a, a career break of more than two or three months. Um, but in any event, you want to explain the reason for the career break, and then very much you want to explain what you did while you were um, on that break, which might have been partially looking for a job, but probably there were other activities that you engaged in. And you want to really show how you used your time to um, sort of enhance yourself. Um, so definitely feel free to use the optional employment box for the, um, sorry, the optional essay to explain your employment. Um, I don't think it's my opinion that a career break in and of itself is not a problem as long as you can explain it. Um, and so you do want to make sure that you use that space to say why you left one job for another or um, whatever else it might be. So, um, you know, in, in terms of the essay, the overall kind of core essay for the school, it's possible that um, a career change might fit in there depending on the question. But my guess is it probably doesn't. Uh, and I would expect that the kind of employment gap fits primarily in an optional essay and maybe in um, in the short answer somewhere. Yeah. You know, if, if that layoff was so eye opening and has changed the path of your life since, maybe it is in that core essay. But, you know, but on the flip side, it could re very reasonably not be there at all. And just in that optional essay, which I think is a great, a great point. Um, we will, you know, if you have additional questions, please add them. I will say if you have a phone or something, you're watching this like or screenshot it, however, use this list. Um, we were intentional about creating these 10 steps. Um, this is really hard. You, applying to these three schools and, and developing compelling and, and interesting and dynamic applications, you know, pieces of work that reflect you. This takes a lot of time and strategy. It is challenging. So we created these tips to, to help guide you is just sort of a making sure you're staying on track. So take a screenshot, whatever of this, so you can refer to it as you work on your applications. It's even critical and even relevant now, if you are looking, staring down those round two deadlines, which are really fast approaching, this can be a great checklist to make sure that you are doing the right things and keeping the right things top of mind. Um, I, we really, um, we didn't include much information about our services. We really wanted to make sure that you guys got some really good direction on working on these three applications. 
Um, but I will say just two things. If you have specific questions or want to get a closer read on your experience, or if you are interested in, in working with us on your applications, definitely vis visit our website, gatehouseadmissions.com, and you can request a free consultation. Um, and that would be completely personalized to you. It's 30 minutes of time with an expert on the team that you can answer whatever questions or you can ask whatever questions you have um, and also get a preview of what it might be like to work with us in a more formal arrangement as well. So I know we are we are up on the hour mark, um, but just really quickly, we'll answer um, just one or two questions. Is there a bias towards the GMAT score? Um, Mitesh asked this. It's a great question. No, there is not. There used to be for sure, but now there is not. Whether you take the GMAT or GRE, it's all about figuring out the test where you're going to score better on, where you feel more confident. Take that test. It does not matter at all if it's a GMAT or GRE. What does matter is the score that you get on that test. That's what the schools are going to be most interested in. Um, uh, and then let's see, is there bias towards, oh, Indian applicants need to score higher on GMAT and other countries low. So now it's like, what GMAT score? It is, look, the big thing that all of you should take away is like you want to do the best that you can on the, um, on the test and to be aware of the averages, whether that's the average that's published by the school in terms of the um, what's accepted, or it could also be looking at GMAC um, averages from particular regions as well. But these schools are looking for excellence, so you need to have you know, and I'm not trying to say any of this to, to to intimidate you guys. It's more to, again, think about what it is the schools are looking for in those expectations and to do your best to, to not only meet them, but to beat them. And that um, pertains to the GMAT or GRE test score as well. Um, all right, guys, we're going to wrap. But um, thank you so much. Thank you, a huge thank you to GMAT Club. We always like doing events with um, the crew at GMAT Club. So thanks to everybody at GMAT Club for letting us um, share this content for you. We know this applying to these schools are daunting. So we really hope this session was helpful. I'm gonna say it again, give us a good old thumbs up, like it um, on YouTube if you're watching it. And definitely come back to this because our our goal in, was making this to real uh, making this more evergreen, um, so that you know even if you're applying a few years out next year, whatever it might be, you can come back to this and use this as a resource. Um, and you can always reach out to us too. We love chatting to folks as they are going through the application process. So thank you all, um, and I also want to say thank you, Rachel, as well. Thanks for uh, helping me. Um, uh, do this presentation. It's always fun to present together because I find that any time that I have the um, the good fortune of having one of my peers or any of our peers on these presentations, I always learn stuff. And I love the, the way that Rachel talks about doing research on schools um, and thinking strategically about the resume too. So thank you very much, Rachel. And thanks, everybody. Thanks, Liza. We wish everybody lots of luck. All right. Take care. Oh, in one... Uh, I'm going to, because I got it. Uh, one more question, Kanya, do applicants start essays at this time with a round two deadline or should they rather look at round three? Basically, is it too late for January? It's not too late for January, but there's a lot of work. I would discourage you from thinking round three. Um, there are just fewer spots. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, good luck, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.